Hello, my name is Ilya Gipp, and I'm the subject matter expert for oncology solutions in Philips Healthcare. Today, I would like to talk about personalization of prostate cancer care. Doing this through integration of data is one of the aspects of how personalization may come into practice, and it is therefore I would like to dedicate this lecture to the solutions that can actually help us to do a better job in integrating everything in men's health service line. In order to start, I would like to give some of the trends together with the challenges that we might face today and hopefully agree upon to build a common ground in what I will be talking about. So on the left side, this is something positive. This is the bright future. This is the positive things that we currently have today. One of them is availability of screening. It's relatively easy today to recruit patients into cancer care pathways, specifically when we talk about prostate cancer. There is more patients. There is also significant developments in localizing and characterizing lesions. We see that diagnostic tools become more precise, become more quantified, more objective. Therefore, I take this as a very positive development. We also see the increased number of treatment options, and that includes targeted and focal therapies. So by default, personalization is happening with or without us wanting this. Greater capabilities for personalization and precision of treatments is a given today. Decreased mortality and improved survivorship prognoses is the fact of life for prostate cancer care in despite of geographies, in despite of stages, there is greater abilities to see and to treat our patients. But on the right side, there is also darker clouds, some of which is related to the developments on the left side. For example, there is more patients, but there is also a growing pressure on men's health service lines. There's greater expectancies for better efficiencies. And how can we deal and cope with more information and the larger amounts of patients? Also, developments in localizing, characterizing cancers can be also hurdled by the fact that the data remains siloed across service lines and service providers. And it's not only that, but it's also the siloed data between professionals or between hospitals that is dragging us down and not allowing everything to be as actionable and as impactful as it's supposed and intended to be. The increased number of treatment options also brings up the complexity for the correct patient stratification. Making the right decision is becoming complex, and therefore I put this in the right column. Together with greater capabilities comes the greater responsibility, but do we have enough tools that allow us to measure the quality? Um, do we have guidelines? And in the overall drive towards value-based care, do we have metrics that is valid and easy to use across prostate cancer care service line. Decreased mortality increases the number of patients post-treatment, but do we have enough capabilities for therapy assessment and following up on our patients and manage them after the treatment? So keeping everything in mind that is depicted on this slide, I would like to make this more visible through the way how I envision the prostate cancer service line, state-of-the-art prostate cancer. So first of all, we are looking towards precision and personalization of care. Prostate service line or prostate cancer care service line is starting from an early detection, diagnosis, staging, treatment selection, therapy planning, and deployment of that therapy, and then assessment and the follow-up. Along the way, there is plenty of various tools, products, solutions that support us in each and every step along the way. Now, this list is not definitive. So every year brings us something new. But nevertheless, so if we're looking today, there is already a lot. This is actually not the topic of my discussion because I will be only using some examples from the lists that are depicted here. But if I just try to look in what exactly is missing and what would I like to address in this short time of this lecture, I would like to focus on two main things or two pillars that, in my view, are missing at this step. 
So first of all, what about the actionability and the insightfulness of information? Well, we would agree on, I hope we will agree, that there is a lot more data. How actionable is this? How insightful is the diagnostic data in the process of therapy planning? How useful is it in deploying the therapy? Are we using uh, the, the follow-up data to actually help us to make decisions about further, about next patients? So this is number one, actionability and insightfulness of information. But along the way, maybe partially separated, partially it's the same thing, is how can the data be properly orchestrated? Properly orchestrated along the way of prostate cancer care service line. So through the prism of those two aspects, the actionability and the insightfulness of information and the orchestration of data, I would like to bring a few examples. And I would like to start with something that is rightfully having its place in prostate cancer care service line, which is one of the modalities that is used primarily for imaging today, and that is the magnetic resonance imaging. So if I'm looking today, MR is being widely used for prostate cancer care as a diagnostic tool. Maybe not in every, um, for every patient, but in the majority of patients, it plays a significant role. So my concern and the idea that I would like to bring into this lecture is how can we integrate MR so that it plays a more significant role so that the data that comes from the MR can be also insightful, impactful along the whole prostate cancer care service line. And in order to do this, it actually has to play a role in more than just detection and precision diagnosis. It needs to play a role also in screening, in image-guided biopsies, and also theranostics and stratification used, for, used with MR imaging, also MR-based therapy planning and simulation, MR-navigated therapy deliveries, and the last but not the least, therapy assessment and follow-up. Let's start to go one by one because, well, I probably think that diagnostic MR is not that much of an interest because it is pretty obvious. However, every year is bringing us new developments in what MR can contribute to the prostate uh, cancer care diagnosis and the usefulness of this data along the whole prostate cancer care pathway. Starting with MRI in cancer screening. Again, maybe a big question mark whether this would ever be possible to use MR as the real screening tool for prostate cancer. But nevertheless, there is quite some developments that help us to make MR to go a lot faster and actually make it go so fast that it can potentially act as partially a screening tool, but indeed for sure, maybe not 100% screening, but for early detection. This is just an example of what can be done with MR today by significantly decreasing the time of the scanning and nevertheless get an amazing data sets that are objectively bringing us better understanding what type of lesions, what kind of prostate are we, uh, what kind of prostate cancer are we dealing in the patient. The other example is uh, the good old diffusion weighted imaging in detecting prostate cancer. So this is a comparison of diffusion weighted imaging based on EPI, so uh, uh, ecoplanar imaging. And on the right, it's a TSE based. And you can see that there is a much less distortion that is seen on the right. And it's also 25% faster. For something that was once a very sophisticated, dedicated diagnostic tool can now be used for screening. Diagnostic MR, as I already mentioned, might probably be the easiest way to demonstrate the usefulness of the MR, and that's not the topic of my discussion. Nevertheless, I'm just going to show a few things that, in my view, make sense for any prostate cancer care service line to get a hands on. First of all, it's the confidence and it's the objectivity of data. So we have wonderful images. As a radiologist, I can clearly witness this. But it's also important that all of these data sets, they become also much more objective. By bringing this high quality scanning, we remove subjectivity from the diagnostic process and therefore make it possible for professionals to use this data uh, to the more impactful way. 
Another thing is the quantification that can be used, as I mentioned, for objectivity, but it can also be used for other things like saving us time. Precision of localization and characterization is impossible without actually having the tools that can very much show us the tumor by, for example, suppressing everything behind this so that the tumor actually pops up. Well, with diffusion-weighted imaging and high B factors, this was possible, but this was taking a lot of time. So computed diffusion-weighted imaging is allowing us to see it with a lot faster scanning and thus also bringing us the valid diagnostic information earlier than later and with greater precision for this precise diagnosis. So that we can move on using image-guided biopsies. Something that used to be always um, ultrasound-based can now also be MR-based or MR image fusion-based together with ultrasound. It can all start from the fact that multiparametric MRI imaging can be done today so easily that any MR system can run the scans and with a semi-automated process, the reporting can be done in the pirate's format so that the selection of the regions that demand a biopsy would be easily shown and then exported into the biopsy into the biopsy system. So here is an example of image fusion biopsy, where MR data is overlapped over the real-time ultrasound, and the proper uh, projection of the MR is being overlaid over the ultrasound data set so that when the, uh, when the needle guidance is actually required, the, uh, the data is seen and the lesion that is characterized with the pyrads, as I have shown in the previous slice, is actually then being taken into account. Moving forward, <clears throat> all those popular terms, theranostics, but using MR also for stratifying patients or staging our patients so that the data that we use in bringing into the decision making is the best possible data so that we can make the first time right decision about what would be the best possible treatment for the patient. So this would not be possible by, without stepping outside of the MR. Uh, digitization of pathology data is one of the ways on how to elevate the accuracy and then potentially also correlate this with our findings in MRI. So if I'm looking at the digitization uh, in radiology that occurred already years ago, digitization of in pathology makes it easier to actually understand the location on where the biopsy sample has been taken to also potentially involve some of the algorithms of artificial intelligence or computed pathology. But the most importantly is compared to a conventional microscope, this can also save time, makes communication between professionals a lot easier and eventually help us to get to a better decision faster. Having said that, then comes the step of making the decision which will be a lot better if we have data that is depicted on the radiology side and from the pathology side on one screen. We can also depict the prostate and show the 3D model and the biopsy sample locations so that this correlation of the data becomes a lot easier test. It would be wonderful for the sake of orchestration of data that I've showed at the very beginning if we have all patient history in one line so that we can also pull up the right data at the right time and thus making it the best possible decision and selecting the pathway for the patient. Moving forward, MR-based therapy planning and simulation. It would not be possible to speak about MR planning of the therapy without mentioning radiation oncology. As a matter of fact, in the past decades, we have seen a growing number of uh, publications that mention the use of MR in radiation therapy, specifically for navigation or simulation. And prostate is actually one of the biggest contributors uh, to those uh, publications and to those mentionings in the peer-reviewed papers. This is why 
This is a CT data sets on the left, okay? The pelvis and the prostate is here, but I also brought up the image from head and neck just for the sake of better um, showing it. And if I would start overlapping MR data set of the same patient over the CT, we can see structures a lot better. Greater soft tissue contrast, more functional information that can come from the MRI will help us to better understand the lesion location, the organ location, and indeed also for the safety of the patient to do a better job in delineating the organs at risk. Well, if our eyes can do the job better for seeing those structures, well, why not let the diagnostic tool or the imaging tool to also do the segmentation by itself? This is an example of the structures that are being uh, depicted and delineated by the MRI console, and that's the 3D model that is then exported into, uh, the, into the treatment planning system. But because of the originating MR data set, those structures are much more consistent and also more accurate. This is an example brought to me by Electem. So we're doing the seminal vesicle salvage. So this was the patient with an initial treatment with a low-dose uh, brachytherapy. And you can see that on the left, we see the CT image, which is still the gold standard uh, for simulation and radiation therapy planning. And because of the markers, because of the fiducials that are inside the prostate, we see all kinds of artifacts inside, inside the scanning volume. While actually doing the MR on the same patient, well, we see actually less artifact, even though metal might not be as MR friendly, but it is also not as CT friendly. And we can see a better delineation of structures. We can do a better delineation of structures by using MR and by involving the MR. There is also a dedicated MR simulators. Now, this is not a commercial talk, but I brought this example to show that there is also a possibility to use the same MR that we are used to to see in diagnostic imaging for simulation and planning. Now, basically, the flat couch top will turn our MR uh, diagnostic tool into a simulator so that the same device can also play a role not only in screening on early detection, but also in diagnosis and then also uh, planning of the therapy. What about quality assurance? Because, well, unfortunately, magnetic field is not as linear as the X-ray beams in the CT. Well, therefore, it needs to be a proper quality assurance if we want to go accurate. So this is just an example of the dedicated phantoms that can help us to control geometric distortions and make sure that the data set could be trustworthy for planning radiation therapy and eventually deploying radiation therapy. When the image on the right is actually an automatically generated measurement that shows the level of distortion uh, based on the distance uh, from the isocenter and based on the, the color is depicting the uh, millimeters of distortion showing I'll say for one millimeter green line showing a little bit of a closer to the isocenter distortion. But it's also possible today to export this data or to even process this. Something that was actually uh, available um, in some uh, dedicated software can now be also done on the console of the same simulator that is being used for planning radiation therapy for prostate cancer. Another example of the developments and the growing role of MR and in integrating a single modality in the broader scale pathway for prostate cancer patients is the ability to generate CT-like data on the console of MR in an automated way. So the upper left images and the enlarged image on the right is the MR-based or synthetic CT MRI data only density map that is built by the MR so that dose planning can be done by just using MR data sets without involving the CT. Now the CT data set, I still put it here on the bottom left of the image so that just uh, to, for, to show that <laughs> it's very well correlated, uh, but it's also possible to demonstrate that the difference between the dose distribution, MR-based, CT-based, is really falling within uh, probably just 1% difference 
if I compare uh, the MR and the CT based. So the scale on the right over here is actually having different percentages. So it's very little, um, well, to probably even say insignificant. So also on the dose volume um, uh, DVH uh, histogram that we see on the left, so the difference between the CT and the MR is the difference between the solid line and the dotted line, which once again is virtually not there. What can it give to us? So I showed that the MR can do a more precise job and more accurately depicting the organs. It can provide information about potentially using uh, the uh, potentially bringing information about the functional and characterizing and localizing the lesions better. But here is the snapshot of the publication uh, that I just ran across a couple of years ago, comparing the conformal radiation therapy uh, with, with IMRT and then uh, the suggested way uh, of dose painting uh, planning radiation therapy, so also being more safe, more precise, more aggressive on the tumor, and much less aggressive on the organs at risk and on the organ itself. This is called dose painting. And the question is not really about the planning of the dose, but the question in how can we bring in the information uh, and what information can be uh, brought in to actually make us use this tool? Because the probability of adverse effects with dose painting is a lot less and the tumor control probability is significantly higher. Okay, well, the MR data can actually help us to start this process of migrating our planning of the therapy to be more focal, even when we talk about something that was always considered a pretty radical therapy like radiation oncology. Here is another example, uh, talking about the same seminal vesicle salvage, uh, so uh, improving radiation therapy and precision in target delineation. So this is a CT-based delineation of the target, and this is the MR-based delineation of the target. And you can see that the overlap over the rectum and over the bladder is a lot less possible if the MR data set is actually being used. So not only it is more accurate in helping us to irradiate the tumor more precisely, but it is also helping us to be more safe and avoid adverse effects of radiation therapy, making the overall prostate cancer care um, service line more efficient and more attractive. Moving forward, can we also use MR for navigating therapy? And I think this is also one of the areas where most of the developments will be coming as long as we take into account everything that I just mentioned on the role of the MR of characterizing and localizing the lesions. Because we already have the tools that enable us to real-time navigate radiation therapy. So MR can play the role and can be the tool to show us the structures in real time. So for any kind of the motion, patient motion, um, we can actually do a better job navigating the dose. So imagine if we overlap those developments that I have just shown in bringing functional information, making all those tools that bring us an impactful and actionable data into planning the therapy and then combining this with the most precise and real-time adjusted way to uh, treat the patient. I believe the outcomes, pretty empirically, we can say that they will be better. And the, by the way, this is the example of an MR guided dose delivery in radiation oncology. But bringing it further, what about um, temperature? What about ablative procedures? This is an example of MR guided transurethral ultrasound ablation, where MR acts as a real-time thermometer and navigating temperature delivery in potentially, uh, well, in homogeneous, highly perfused organ, uh, and then allowing to build the temperature inside the prostate, whether the complete prostate ablation, or maybe going a sector, uh, or sector by sector ablation, and then in real time, volumetrically measuring this dose and seeing how the actual temperature is building inside the prostate in this, also using this as, as, as a treatment without implying radiation. So real-time guidance, 
Uh, it's it's a transurethral, so uh, little but invasive tool, but also a promise of another area where MR can play the role in helping us to do a better job in prostate cancer care service lines. Coming closer to the end of my presentation, I would like also to briefly touch the subject of therapy assessment and follow-up. So MR can indeed play the role in also helping us to assess the therapy and also adapt the therapy between the treatments. As we are moving towards uh, single payment models in a lot of countries, uh, but also trying to do a better job clinically, so what if we can do um, and use MR uh, for adjusting the contours, uh, for taking into account uh, the changes in the bladder, uh, filling in the rectum position and rectum condition, and then also be more aggressive by potentially using five fractions, um, well, exceeding 36 gray per fraction. Well, we want to be more careful and we want to be more precise. And indeed, MR can help us uh, to do this job better. This is an example of uh, intrafractional imaging with an MR and thus also using MR to uh, adapt the therapy, uh, eventually targeting for the better clinical outcomes. This is another publication that ran across um, probably a couple of years ago. Um, so the use of diffusion-weighted imaging uh, in uh, assessment of adverse effects in radiation therapy, but actually doing this uh, before those effects become symptomatic. So very early signs of those, um, of those side effects can be seen and measured by using quantitative MR in the way of diffusion-weighted imaging. And this is talking about the proctopathy so that if we see those signs building up, we can do the adaptation of radiation therapy and potentially avoid it while there is still time to do this. Another example is amide proton transfer imaging, a quantified method uh, that allows us to understand where the tumor is actually responding to the treatment. Now, APT imaging is, in my view, uh, having a great promise uh, in also characterizing the tumor, uh, characterizing the lesion, uh, but it's also possible to use it in assessment, whether we're doing uh, something that affects the tumor and what is the functional condition of that tumor past the treatment. So this is what I've tried to show, MR imaging along cancer care pathway. I talked about the insightfulness uh, of the data along the cancer care pathway, and in prostate, I have just selected MR to be one example of what we may possibly do by integrating those data sets and this data from even a single MR across the whole prostate cancer care service line, helping us to do a better job. And I would like to finish with the last slide of actually showing, and to somewhat connected to what I mentioned, state-of-the-art personalization of prostate cancer care and the expected changes in men's health service line so on the left, something that we see more or see more today, traditional cancer care, and on the right, changing this to the state-of-the-art models of cancer care and really building the state-of-the-art uh, prostate, uh, prostate cancer service lines. So conventional imaging is indeed existing today, but I think uh, if we can move quantified imaging into a routine, use all those biomarker um, biomarkers in imaging uh, using the concepts of theranostics and actionable data making it available at other stages, I believe conventional imaging becomes the matter of the past, while what I described and showed a few examples is hopefully becoming our today and tomorrow. Randomized biopsies approach that is also widely used depending on the countries, on the geographies, is now giving way to something that is more precise, something that is uh, more accurate, uh, avoiding false negatives, uh, bringing more comfort to the patient, reducing the amount of patients uh, that need to stay on active surveillance, and that could be image-guided, multimodality, uh, navigated fusion biopsies. Conventional pathology 
together with the with the with the image guided biopsies uh, and bringing conventional pathology into a digital pathology with possible ways for computational tools and uh, AI possibilities uh, is another thing which then all together comes to move and to drive us from non-correlated findings and non-correlated findings data to become correlated, for example, between radiology and the pathology. We talk today about radiomics, but how to make this practical, easy, and bring this into the routine. I believe what I show on this slide is indeed the drive towards this state-of-the-art um, uh, tools uh, in, in prostate cancer care. So correlated data is proven to be more impactful and insightful. And at the end, radical treatments, I believe they give way to something that is maybe a same as radical on the tumor, but, but much less radical on the patient and on the organ. So evidence-based personalized cancer care is also uh, the drive towards focal therapies. And in my view, focal therapies is one of the trends but it requires everything that I mentioned before and above this line on this slide that can help us to do a better job with those focal therapies. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Have a great day.